The Equitable Life Assurance Society presents... This is your FBI. This is your FBI. The official broadcast from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. Transcribed and presented as a public service by the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States and the Equitable Society's representative in your community. Tonight we have in our radio audience thousands of people who will be listening for the middle commercial, all because of a postcard. Yes, a postcard they received in the mail this morning from a representative of the Equitable Life Assurance Society. But whether you received a postcard from your equitable man or not, the Equitable Society and its representatives urge you to listen to tonight's middle commercial. It's an important message, describing the Equitable Society's independent 60s plan. A practical, workable plan for people who want to be independent at the age of 60. I'll be back in approximately 14 minutes to give you full information on this special plan offered by the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States. Tonight's FBI file, The Transatlantic Shakedown. In the old days, before there was such a thing as the Federal Bureau of Investigation, crime was a localized affair. It was possible in those days, if the crime was discovered soon enough, to isolate an entire community until the criminal had been apprehended. And even in those instances where he made good his escape, the criminal could not get very far because the means of transportation at his disposal were meager, even if he lived in one of the nation's largest cities. Today, however, all of that has changed. In this age of jet propulsion, it is possible for a man to commit a crime in one city and for him to take refuge in another city 3,000 miles away before the very crime has been discovered. It is true that the progress made in transportation has also made it easier for the special agents of your FBI to cover a tremendous amount of territory. But the greater advantage has come to the criminal for he and he alone is the one who decides the exact moment at which a crime will be committed. Because he is by occupation an opportunist, he chooses that moment which will afford him the greatest lapse of time between his crime and the beginning of the search for him. Tonight's case from the files of your FBI, for example, is international in scope because of that ease of modern day travel and takes us first to the city of eternal gaiety Paris. Tonight's file opens in an elevator, which is slowly climbing to the top of the Eiffel Tower in Paris. The elevator operator also acts as guide. Le temps est clair aujourd'hui, et quand nous arriverons au premier étage dans un instant, vous pourrez voir jusqu'à 30 kilomètres. À votre droite. Isn't this a beautiful view, Mother? Yes, Paul, but, but what? But I, I don't understand all this. Our coming here? Yes. I have a very special reason. I'll explain it when we get to the top. Very well. Look, look, dear. There's our hotel. Oh, of course. Goodness, I'd forgotten how clearly things could be seen from here. Wait, dear. Let's go this way, where we can be alone. All right. Well, Mother, take a good look. You may not see Paris again for quite some time. What do you mean? We're leaving. But for where? The States. Paul. I've got to go back to see Don Jackson. But you just went to London to clear up the Jackson matter. I went to London to see Mr. Jackson's representative. 
What happened? He wanted to settle my entire claim against Don Jackson for $5,000. Why, that's ridiculous. That's what I told him. And? He got very angry. He threatened me. And, well, I was forced to use violence. That's why I've got to go back to see Don Jackson in person. Just because you had a fight with his representative? Mother, I killed him. A few days later, back in the United States, in an FBI field office, Agent Keith Thompson approaches the desk of Special Agent Jim Taylor. Jim, I just got your note. Oh, hi, Keith. What's this stuff about a closed file? That's what we're working on. A closed case? That's right. Closed since 1945. Well, at last. This is the case I've been waiting to work on, one that's already been solved. Oh, it's not that simple, Keith. This is a file on a man named Paul Black. Uh Uh-huh. The first entry we have is dated July 11th, 1935. Now, on that date, we received a complaint that Paul Black had possibly swindled two old women out of some real estate in this city. What kind of real estate, Jim? They owned the terminal building here. By the time they discovered that Black was a swindler, he had sold the property to a man named Don Jackson. Now, Jackson swore that he bought it in good faith, so the only chance the women had to recover their money was to ask the courts to intervene and set aside the transaction. And I assume that when prosecution was started, Black was among the missing. Mm Mm-hmm. We made a rather complete search for him, but no lead turned up for three years. Which would have been 1938? That's right. Well, at that time, we found that he'd gone to France. In some way, he had managed to get himself a passport. In his own name? No, he used an alias. We notified the French Sûreté, but they had no success in locating him. Then came the war, and early in 1945, we got a report on Black from the Army. Our Army? Yeah, As they were moving through France toward the German border, they found the body of a man who carried the identification papers of Paul Black. Hmm. The body was terribly mutilated, but the identification papers carried his picture, so they sent that picture back to this country. Was it identified as Black? That's right. Well, they buried him. We made a notation on his file that he was dead, and the file was closed. I don't understand what we're doing with it now, Jim. Two days ago, Washington got a routine report from Scotland Yard to check some fingerprints, Keith. Those prints belong to Paul Black. How could that be? Well, that's what the SAC wants us to find out. Here's the whole file right here. Let's go through it again and see if we can find an answer to that. Is that you, Mother? Yes, dear. How was your walk? Very enjoyable. Fine. Have you spoken to Don Jackson yet? No, I called, but he wasn't in. Oh. His secretary said she'd have him call me. Paul, you'd be amazed at the way things have changed since we left. Really? New buildings, new stores. Say, do you remember that bank that was closed and somebody turned it into one of those speakeasies? Uh Uh-huh. It's a bank again. Splendid. And you should see the place right across... Oh, pardon me, Mother. Oh. Hello? Is this Elmwood 69171? That's right. Hello, Don. Who is this? Paul Black. Huh? Paul Black. Oh. I didn't think it would be very smart to leave my name at your office, so I just left the number. I... I see. I'd appreciate your canceling any appointments you have for the next hour or so, Don. Why? Because I'm going to pay you a visit. And I think you'll want to see me alone. Keith. Keith, I just got that report from Scotland Yard. On Paul Black? Indirectly, it was about a man named John Ross. Who's he? An American who was found dead in a London hotel room ten days ago. Oh. Paul Black's fingerprints were found in that room. Was this Ross murdered? Well, apparently. One thing that hasn't been found yet, though, is his passport. You know, I think Black might attempt to use it. How about notifying immigration? I already have. They're going to be on the lookout for him. Um, I ran down a lead myself. Oh? What was it? Well, I checked on Black's wife. I tried to find some indication on whether she left the country with him. Any results? Yeah. I found a bank account in her name at the Security National. The last deposit was made shortly before Black disappeared. He left in a hurry, didn't he, Jim? Yeah. Yeah. Well, if she left the account, that would indicate that she went with him. 
And I'd say we could assume that if he's coming back, so is she. Mm -hmm. Keith, why don't you call the bank and ask them to call you if Mrs. Black shows up for the money? I've already covered that. Oh, swell. Oh, our records also show that she also had a uh, favorite beauty shop and a favorite dressmaker. You might check on them, too. Will do. Meanwhile, I'll wait here for some word from the code room. What's doing up there? They're decoding a message that came in from the Paris Sûreté a little while ago. On this case? Yes, and as soon as that message is decoded and translated, we should have a lot more information on Mr. Paul Black. Mr. Jackson? Yes, Miss Crawford, what is it? And Mr. Black to see you. Have him come in. Yes, sir. You may come in, Mr. Black. Thank you, miss. Hello, Don. Hello. It's good to see you again. My, my, you haven't changed a bit. I was just saying to my wife this morning, I wonder if Don still... Paul, let's get this over with as soon as possible. Oh, very well. Did a representative of mine contact you from London, a man named Ross? Yes, I saw him. Did he offer you a cash settlement? Yes, but I turned the offer down. Why? $5,000 $5,000 isn't a very fair settlement. Paul, you've been blackmailing me for 14 years now. Just this morning, I compiled my payments to you. They total more than $55,000. Well, your figures are very accurate. Then how much more do you want from me? Well, let's explore my assets. I don't have to remind you that if I were to let the police come into possession of certain papers... You'd, you'd go to the police? Oh, I could do it without revealing my own identity. And... If I did, this building would not only be returned to those two old ladies we uh, acquired it from, but you'd be in jail. Do you realize that, John? Yes. Splendid. Then I'd say I want another $50,000. $50,000? That's my price. That's a fortune. (laughs) That's why I want it. And I want it in cash by tomorrow afternoon. Keith, I think I found something that might help us. We can use it. I started to check into the background of John Ross. The man who was murdered in London? Yeah. Well, I found that he used to work for a man here in town named Don Jackson. He's the one who owns the terminal building. Mm Mm-hmm. And as you recall, he bought it from Black. Oh, that's interesting. Well, I called Jackson's office a little while ago, but he was in conference. His secretary said that she'd contact me as soon as he was through. Good. Jim, I've just finished going over this report from the Paris Sûreté. And? And we know now for sure that Paul Black is back in this country. How? They located the missing passport of John Ross. They did where? In the hands of a black market passport operator in Paris. And under questioning, this operator admitted that he made a deal with Paul Black. Oh. He took the Ross passport from Black and gave him one in the name of Howard Poole. Uh, that pins the murder on Black, but why do you say we know that he's back in this country now? Because I checked immigration. And their records show that a Howard Poole flew from France to New York this week. That was Paul Black, of course, using the forged passport. Oh, oh, excuse me, Keith. Special Agent Taylor speaking. Hello, Mr. Taylor. This is Miss Crawford, Mr. Don Jackson's secretary. Oh, yes, Miss Crawford. Something terrible has happened. Mr. Jackson just committed suicide. return in just a minute to tonight's exciting case from the official files of your FBI. Tonight, on the 8th of July, when we stand midway between America's Independence Day, July 4th, and France's Independence Day on July 14th, seems a specially suitable time to invite you to take advantage of the Equitable Society's famous Independent 60s plan. The Equitable Society created this plan for self-reliant Americans who want to keep on being independent after they reach the age of 60, who want to be self-supporting and self-respecting when it's time for them to retire. Many equitable members who have cashed in on this plan live in spots where the weather is ideal all year long. My wife and I make our home in Asheville, North Carolina. What a climate. Cool all summer. Never cold in winter. People who have retired on equitable independent 60s plans can afford to travel. They have time for their hobbies. My hobby is my workshop down in the basement. 
You ought to see some of the furniture I've built since I retired. And to think that for years I thought I couldn't afford a plan like this. What do you mean? I thought you had to be rich to go in for an independent 60s plan. What opened your eyes? My Equitable Society representative. He showed me that I was already halfway towards independent 60s, thanks to Social Security and the life insurance I already own. That's a fact. In many cases, only a small amount of additional insurance is required to enable a man to look forward with complete confidence to independent 60s. A few extra dollars a week did it for me. So why not see your equitable representative without delay? Phone him soon. Or send a postcard care of this station to the Equitable Society. That's E-Q-U-I-T-A-B-L-E. The Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States. And now back to the FBI file, The Transatlantic Shakedown. The Federal Bureau of Investigation has under its jurisdiction the enforcement of some 120 federal statutes. Statutes which cover crimes ranging alphabetically from arson to willful murder. All of those crimes are prosecuted with equal vigilance, for no crime can be said to be less serious than another when any of them might and frequently does involve the lives of decent human beings. However, it is doubtful if the special agents take as much personal interest in apprehending any criminal as they do in bringing to justice the most despicable of the lawbreakers, the extortioner. Here is a man who preys on the weaknesses of his fellow human beings, and who in almost every instance is more ruthless than even a professional killer. As you have seen in tonight's case from the files of your FBI, there are no lengths to which the extortioner will not go. No crime he will not commit to maintain his point of vantage. In tonight's case, it so happens that the extortion victim was himself a criminal, but that is rare. For the most part, the victim is a decent but thoroughly frightened citizen. If by any chance you are being victimized by a blackmailer, your FBI advises you to take the only course of action that is open to you. The only course of action which will free you and at the same time defeat the blackmailer. That course of action is to call your local police. Tonight's file continues in the apartment of Mr. and Mrs. Paul Black. Paul? Yes, Mother. Oh, I didn't see you. Why, you're not dressed yet. I know. But you said to hurry home so we could go to dinner and a show. Mother, the roof has fallen in. What? I called Don Jackson's office this afternoon to find out when to pick up the money. Didn't he have it? He'd committed suicide. (gasps) What a dreadful thing to do to you. You don't know how dreadful. We spent all our money to get over here, Mother. We haven't enough left to get even one of us back to Paris. Oh, don't worry about that. Mother, if anyone finds out that we're in this country... I have a way for us to get back to Paris. How? Well, I was going through my trunk today. I found all sorts of old things. Stationery I hadn't used. A list of people we sent Christmas cards to in 1934. Mother, how does that get us back to Paris? I also found an old bank book. An account that I have at the Security Bank. Don't you remember that account? Yes, yes, I do. How much have you got in it? A little over $1,100. Splendid. As soon as the bank opens tomorrow morning, go down and get the money. We'll be on our way back to Paris tomorrow night. I thought I was going to be the first one in this oh, morning. I beat you to it, kid. Anything come in overnight on Paul Black? No. no. I'm afraid we're getting cold again. Do you suppose it's possible that Black would return to this country without coming here? Oh, wouldn't think it was very probable that he would. Oh, Jim. Oh, yes, George. I have a message for you. No, what is it? A Mr. Hughes at the security bank called in. Oh, hey, Keith, isn't that the man you went to see yesterday? That's right, Jim. What did he say, George? 
Uh, Mrs. Black was in there about 15 minutes ago. Did he say anything about a man being with her? No. Mr. Hughes tell you whether or not Mrs. Black left any address or phone number? Yeah, here it is. Hey, fine, thanks. Keith. Keith, this is what we've been waiting for. I'm going to pay a call on Mrs. Black. <laughs> Hello. Hello, Paul. It's me. Mother, where are you? In a phone booth. Where have you been? Just doing a little shopping. Did you get the money at the bank? Uh, no, not yet. Why not? They asked me to come back at one o'clock. Why? They said the account had been dead for so long that they needed a little time to check on it. Well, that sounds like they were stalling. They said they'd call me if they cleared it up before one o'clock. How can they call you? I gave them the telephone number. Oh, Mother. You told them we were living here? Yes. That explains it. Explains what? I heard a man at the door a little while ago. Oh. The bank was probably waiting for you. They must have called the police as soon as you left. What can we do, Paul? Well, they must be watching our place. I'll tell you what. You come on home. All right, Paul. By the time you get here, I'll have something figured out. Just a minute, please. Good afternoon. Are you Mrs. Mary Blank? That's right. I'm a special agent of the FBI. Oh. Here are my credentials. Well, won't you come in, Mr. Taylor? Yes, thank you. Now, what can I do for you? We're looking for your husband, Mrs. Black. My, my husband is dead. We have reason to believe otherwise. Why, he was killed during the war in a little town about 100 miles from Paris called Compiègne. Oh, we believed that story at one time, too. Now we have definite proof that he's alive. Oh, no. Have you seen him? Why, not since the day he left this country ten years ago. You weren't in Europe with him? Uh, no. I'd say it's quite a coincidence that you should return here the same week that he did. Mr. Taylor, I have proof that uh, I was not in Europe with my husband. Oh, what kind of proof? Letters. Letters that Paul wrote to me from the time he went away until he was killed. How did he know where to write to you? Well, I... Moved a lot, but I always left a forwarding address. Hmm. May I see the letters, please? Yes, surely. I have them right here in my trunk. Oh, if Paul were alive, he'd still be writing to me. I know he would. Yes, here are the letters. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Now, this one, dated January 23rd, 1945. This is the last letter received from him. Mm -hmm. That was written the day before Paul was killed. I see. He wrote beautiful letters. Do you mind if I take these back to the office with me? Will you promise to return them? I promise, Mrs. Black. I'll return them as soon as I possibly can. Thank you. Goodbye. Goodbye. Paul? Has he gone? Yes. Did you give him the letters? I did. Well, that should clear you. As soon as he returns them, you go to the bank and we'll get out of here. Mother? Yes, Paul? What time is it? Almost six. I won't be able to go to the bank now till tomorrow. I know. Did you make reservations? Yes, our plane leaves tomorrow at noon. Well, I hope... Wait, 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 wait till I get to the bedroom. Yes. Just a minute. Good evening, Mrs. Black. Oh, hello. May I come in, please? Uh, surely. Thank you. I didn't expect my letters back this soon. The men in our laboratory can work very quickly. May I have them? Yes, yes, of course. Here you are. I trust they were 
proof enough. No, I'm afraid they weren't. What do you mean? Those letters weren't written by your husband on the dates indicated. Oh, but they were. You can tell by the stationery. Some of it's so old it's beginning to turn yellow. Paul did write those letters. Oh, I'm not denying that. But you said... You and your husband counted on the fact that we would be thrown off the trail because of the age of the paper. We tested it. It's quite true that the paper is as old as you say it is. Well? One thing you didn't know is that our laboratory keeps a standard of every ink that's manufactured in this country. The tests show the ink on these letters was made in 1949. That's not true. Mrs. Black, I want your husband. What? I know that he's here, so you might as well surrender him. And we can all discuss these letters together. Paul and Mary Black were convicted for a violation of the National Stolen Property Act and sentenced to a federal penitentiary. Detainers were also filed for the extradition of Paul Black to England to be tried for murder. Evidence developed in the criminal proceedings was later used by the two women who were the original property holders to have the transaction by Jackson set aside. And thus they regained the property that was rightfully theirs. That the clue which led to the solution of tonight's case from the files of your FBI was supplied to Special Agent Taylor by the FBI Crime Laboratory will come as no surprise to anyone who has followed the progress made in the field of crime investigation. In that field, science has made tremendous strides, and its use of such machines as the spectrograph, the Geiger counter, the microscope, and every other scientific aid that man has yet devised is increasing daily. In the old days, it was a rare case when the crime lab helped on a case. Now it is an equally rare case when it doesn't. In addition to the lab, though, there was an added factor which helped in the solution of tonight's case, an added factor which is of equal importance. That was the close cooperation among three international law enforcement agencies, Scotland Yard, the French Surete, and the Federal Bureau of Investigation. Your FBI at this time wishes not only to thank those two agencies, but also to convey the hope that their future cooperation will continue to be as close as it has been in the past. In just a moment, we will tell you about next week's exciting case from the files of your FBI. Now, two final questions on the Equitable Society's Independent 60s plan. When I start one of these plans, what happens to the life insurance I now have? Your equitable representative will show you how to integrate it with your plan. Well, how much in cash does this plan pay me after I'm 60? You receive a check every month, the exact amount depending on your present income and your future needs. It takes only a few minutes to work it out, and your Equitable Society representative will be glad to do it for you. Ask him to drop around for a friendly visit. Phone him soon. All right, care of this station to the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States. Next week, we will dramatize another case from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. A dramatic story of a criminal double cross. Its subject, murder. Its title, The Merchant of Death. The incidents used in tonight's Equitable Life Assurance Society's broadcast are adapted from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. However, all names used are fictitious, and any similarity thereof to the names of persons living or dead is accidental. Tonight's broadcast was transcribed, and the music was composed and conducted by Frederick Steiner. The author was Jerry D. Lewis. Your narrator was William Woodson, and Special Agent Taylor was played by Stacey Harris. Others in the cast were Grace Albertson, John Beale, Ed Begley, Jeanette Nolan, Gaylord Pendleton, and Don Randolph. This is your FBI is a Jerry Devine production. This is Larry Keating speaking for the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States and the Equitable Society's representative in your community and inviting you to tune in again next week at this same time when the Equitable Life Assurance Society will bring you another thrilling story from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. The Merchant of Death on This Is Your FBI. This is ABC, the American Broadcasting Company.